So last week I was speaking to you about healing mother wounds. How many of you were here last week? We we're talking about healing mother wounds. If you weren't here, please just catch up via the website because it's a foundation to this particular message. This is part two of healing the mother wounds. I want to encourage you because there are a lot of issues that we're facing today that have been caused by wounding from parents, whether it's a father or a mother. And so it's important and it's crucial that we deal with these things. We can say as much as we want, oh, there's a lot of rape, raping that is going on. Oh, there's a lot of corruption that is going on. Oh, a lot of people are stealing from their companies. But for those of us who do lots of counseling, lots of coaching, we're fully aware that these root issues stem very often from the family unit. How many of you are aware of that? From the family unit, from dysfunction in our families. And as Christians, we need to be aware of this. Some of you are called to be counselors. It's crucial that you know where to go when you're ministering to people. Some of you are called to be mothers. It's crucial that you know how not to wound the next generation. Amen? Some of you are called to be fathers. It's important that you know what the role of the mother of your children is so that you can support her in fulfilling that role. So I'm speaking to a variety of groups here this morning. I'd like you please to turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Proverbs chapter 16 verse 2. Proverbs chapter 16 verse 2. The Bible tells us, it says, people may be pure in their own eyes, but the Lord examines their motives. Some translations say, all a man's ways seem pure to him. And you know what the interesting thing is? They seem pure to other people too. So we judge people based on externals. We tend to judge people based on what they're doing, their outward behavior. And because we are like this in our society, the tendency is for our communities and our churches and our businesses to focus on impression management. As long as I look good on the outside, then I'm fine. But the Bible then says that God, it says, but motives are weighed by the Lord. The Lord examines their motives. How many of you know that my motives very often stem from my needs? And very often my behavior is determined by unmet needs. And very often those unmet needs are maternal needs or paternal needs. Needs that were not met when I was a little baby. So if you didn't truly bond with your mother and God's, God had ordained that you bond with your mother you'll find that you've got unmet needs and you find yourself being driven to do certain things in order to meet that particular need. And that's why the Lord would have us healed where we're still wounded. And you see what's very subtle, especially about maternal needs, mother wounds, what's very subtle about them is they're not too obvious. You see, with parents, they're what we call sins of commission and then they're sins of omission. And when we talk about the sins of omission, we're talking about those things your parents were supposed to do, but they didn't do. And how many of you know that very often we're not conscious of those things because that's all we knew? How many of you know that if you're growing up and your parents are not giving you hugs and kisses, you don't always complain about it until you see your friend's parents doing that all the time to their kids? Amen? So a lot of issues that people have today, they're not aware that there are issues. They're like, well, my parents provided for me. Surely that's enough. Their self-esteem is so low, that's their only expectation. The sad thing is they're passing it on to the next generation. And they're saying, you know what? As long as I provide for my family, then that's fine. You guys are going to school, aren't you? You've got clothes, haven't you? You're going to eat supper and, and lunch today, aren't you? So you should be happy with that. But that was not God's plan for us. It was so much more that we need to be passing on to the next generation as their heritage and their inheritance. Amen. In Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 10, the Bible says, I, the Lord, search the heart and examine the mind to reward each person according to what their deeds deserve. 
So how does God reward us? It's not based on what you do externally. It's based on what we call the driving forces behind your action, the intent. He doesn't just look at the behavior. He looks at the intent behind the behavior. Amen. But I, the Lord, search all hearts. Right now, this morning, he is scanning this room and is not looking at who's got a funky hairstyle. Now, that's what we focus on. What's my hair like? Right? If you've got any. He's not scanning to see how nicely are you dressed. What type of lipstick are you wearing? The Bible tells us that the Lord searches. He says, I, the Lord, search all hearts and examine secret motives. Behind every behavior, there's a belief system and there's intention behind the behavior. And because of the wounding in our lives, a lot of what we do looks good on the outside, but the driving forces behind it are not good. And I don't know about you, but I want to make sure that everything I do, I'm doing from a pure heart. That the motivation of my heart is pure. And how many of you know that it doesn't come by just trying to be pure? You don't go into the day, you don't go into the week with a mentality of, I'm going to be pure. Ooh, focus, focus, focus. Purity. No, it doesn't work that way. The Bible tells us that evil words come out of an evil heart. Amen. So I need to do something about the condition of my heart so that purity flows out. And I'm telling you right now that hurt people hurt others. And you see, if you want to truly connect with another human being, if you want to truly bond with another human being at a subconscious level, people can pick up when something is not sincere. Have you ever noticed, ladies, your husband can come and give you a gift? But he can't con you. He can give you a gift. He can do all sorts of wonderful things. But you can see when he's just trying to manage your impression of him. And that's why sometimes you can interact with someone. Let's say you want to make a new friend. How many of you need friends? I'm seeing hands. I see that hand. I see that hand. How many of you know that if you meet someone for the first time, there are times when you can say to your spouse afterwards, you can say, that person, they did all the right things. Yes, I saw them at church, but there was just something not quite right. Someone got married recently and I was speaking to some people who were at the wedding and they came through and they said, yeah, the wedding was great, but she's made a wrong decision. They said it straight. And we're like, why? Why? Where are you coming from? And you could see, they just said, this guy, he's just, oh, uh, just, and you could see it wasn't a false judgment. You could see, I'm talking about people who aren't necessarily Christians in church and so on, but you could see there's something they were picking up about this individual. He was self-absorbed. He was rude. Amen. You see, very often what tends to happen is we judge people by externals and we become used to that. But we need to be aware of what's going on underneath. And on this journey, some of you might be thinking, but Paul, you're going deep into the psychological stuff. Leave us alone. Just tell me about my breakthrough next week. That's all I want to hear. No, that's very shallow. It's very what? It's very shallow and superficial Christianity because when King David prays, he says, search my heart and see if there's any wicked way within me. Amen? Search my heart, O oh God, and see if there's any wicked way within me. I don't want to come to church and just get some secret formula about how to make another million. Amen? You can go and you can read. That's why we've got books for you there. It's a series we did some time back, Kingdom Wealth, and the book is now there. It's available. Very powerful book, please. Read it. It's got a lot of breakthrough things in terms of wealth creation for Christians and getting into the right mindset. Amen? But what we're dealing with right now is our freedom so that we have sustained breakthrough. So, if you want heart connection with the people around you, God wants you to examine the driving forces behind your behavior. Amen. So what are some common ways in which mothers reject their children? 
There's rejection in the womb, and we spoke about that last week. You can catch up with the notes, but there's rejection that happens even in the womb. There's the unwanted conception. You know that a child can feel a deep sense of shame and rejection. And I shared with you that rejection is not just spirit to spirit. It's also chemical, even through the placenta. Research has been carried out to see and has shown that when a mother is anxious, sometimes that anxiety can pass on to the child. Amen? A traumatic birth, lack of nurturing in infancy, and that's where we have the bonding that takes place. Remember that when a child is crying, what does the child do? What does the par parent do? The mother comes, hugs the child, swaddles the child, right? And the child stops crying. Not so? And then mom leaves the room, and what happens? Baby continues to cry. Because in the, in the mind of the child, mom doesn't exist anymore. That's the developmental stage of that child. Mom doesn't exist anymore. And then mom comes back into the room and the child suddenly goes quiet. The voice of the mother, the tone of the mother, and also father, is extremely influential on the child. And you know what happens? After some time, after a number of months, the child reaches a developmental stage called emotional object constancy. Emotional object constancy. That's where this child has stored up all that nurturing, all that love from mom and dad. And mom and dad don't have to be in the room for baby to feel secure. Amen? And some of you don't really know what happened to you in the first few months of your lives. I'll be seeing my mom quite soon and I'm curious to ask her a few more questions to say, wait a minute, so tell me about the dynamics. Amen? Because how many of you know that culturally with a lot of us, we've got our moms who raised us, generally speaking, but very often you'll hear stories like, you know, then yeah, in that period, yeah, uh, while I was doing such and such, a, your auntie was playing this role, and then this person was playing that role, and so on. And it's important for us to figure out to what extent did I truly bond with my mother? Is everyone following me here this morning? To what extent did we truly bond? So what tends to happen is a lot of people never reach that stage of emotional object constancy. And that's why even as adults today, they've got a fear of abandonment. Hubby goes and he's working overseas for two weeks. And the wife is freaking out. Oh, I feel abandoned and they can't cope. And the kids are like, mom, what's wrong? Dad is going to be coming back in a couple of weeks. But you know that you're experiencing something deep down inside because there's a, there's a root of abandonment in your life. And sometimes what actually happens is a spirit of abandonment can attach itself onto you and harass you and torment you if you yield to the flesh for too long. Next week I'll be speaking about overcoming the flesh by knowing your identity in Christ. And one of the things we have to do is to know who we are in Christ so that we don't entertain those thoughts of abandonment. Say to the person next to you, you will never walk alone. Okay, I'm not a Liverpool fan, but you will never walk alone. <laughs> okay? Just wanted to clarify that. All right? Sometimes there's rejection that takes place because of over-possessiveness and domination. There's certain wounds that children experience because their mothers were possessive. How many of you had moms that were possessive over you? How many of you are struggling to raise your hand? The fact that you feel guilty raising your hand is that because you're like, Mama, Mama's going to come and attack me. All right? There's already a problem there. Okay. All right? But sometimes you have parents who are very possessive and domineering, and it actually affects your self-esteem. Today, there are many people, grown-ups, very smart, very intelligent, but they don't have confidence to start a business. They don't have confidence to step out and to say to their boss, yes, I think I can do that. Where do you think that fear comes from, people? Where do you think that fear comes from? Because when you were a little child, kids are not afraid. You know that it's been found. Some people say that the only fear that you are born with is the fear of falling and the fear of loud noises. All the other fears were learned. So where do you learn that? To say, no, I'm not going to actually sign that business deal in case I fail. 
We all know that to be a great entrepreneur, you have to go through failure. That's university fees. What's wrong with that? What's honestly wrong with that? And you know, someone once said, the things we fear the most have already happened to us. How many of you have never failed? How many of you have never failed? Come on, there was a time when I was at school and I got 0% for a particular test. I got 0%. I'm not ashamed of it. I got 0%. And the guys in class were teasing me, saying, Captain Zero, yo, yo, Captain Zero, yo. They were teasing me. There were a number of us who got 0%. I don't know what, what it was. Some chemistry test and maybe, I don't know, it hadn't been explained properly or something. <laughs> it hadn't been. I didn't always get zero. There was just one of those days where, you ever have it when your kids come home? Come on, you've had it when your kids come home and you're like, what happened? Like Daniel was saying to us, we're like, everything else is great. What happened on this day? Oh, no, 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 no mom, dad, everyone got that. Everyone got low marks for that. <laughs> oh, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> Fear of failure. You know that very often what people call the fear of failure is really the fear of being mocked. It's the fear of embarrassment. That's one of the reasons a lot of people aren't doing great stuff in this, in this life. They were mocked by mom, mocked by dad, and now they're bound by a fear of being mocked. And they make inner vows, a good friend of ours shared with us quite recently. He's about 68 years of age or so. And he said, you know what? My dad mocked me. I think he was playing baseball. He's from the States. He was playing baseball or something. And his dad mocked him. And he said, I, had, I made an inner vow that I will never ever put myself in a position again where I can be mocked. And throughout his life, he took pride in the fact that I'm the background guy. I don't have to be in the limelight. I'll just serve until he broke that thing off his life. He's got a successful business right now. He's written a book on entrepreneurship. He's doing great stuff and he speaks well in front of people. But he was bound by that inner vow in his life that I'll never place myself in a position to be mocked or ridiculed again. And some of you are in that space. God has called you to greatness. But because of that wound, from, it could be a paternal wound, it could be a maternal wound. You're avoiding opportunities in your life because you're afraid of being mocked. Other ways in which mothers can wound their children Tying her identity to the child's performance. Some of you are very performance orientated. You seem fine on the outside, but you've got a mindset that I need to be perfect to be accepted. You've linked your performance with rejection or acceptance. And so you get into a striving mentality. Remember, God looks at the heart. God examines the heart to see why are we doing what we're doing. How many of you know that he wants to take us to a place of self-worth where I know who I am in Christ. I know I'm worthy simply because Jesus died for me and God created me and God don't make no junk. And because I'm worthy, I end up doing worthy deeds. As opposed to the other way around. Because I do all these wonderful things, then I'm worthy as a person. Can you see the difference? Viewing the child as a replacement or replication of someone who died. This happens quite a bit. Happens quite a bit. Sometimes a child could die or a sibling could die and then they have another baby and at a certain point this baby grows up feeling like I was just a replacement. Divorce, we know about that. The way a child interprets divorce is not the same as how adults interpret divorce. Because a child sees the parents as perfect. Infants see their parents as perfect, as superheroes. I told you the one time where my kids were like, Dad, so why don't you play soccer like professionally? Why don't you play with Messi and those guys? I said, guys, because I'm not good enough. And they were confused. It actually confused them. Their dad saying, I'm not good enough. Amen? So if dad rejects mom, if mom leaves dad, in the child's mind, the child internalizes and says, there must be something wrong with me. Child doesn't see it as dad had issues. 
mom struggled relationally. They don't interpret it that way. Amen? Can someone tell the guys outside to please keep quiet? Thank you. Release for adoption or attempted adoption. Rejection of the child's gender. I was reading of a particular guy. His dad really wanted a girl because they were already boys in the family. And then he comes out a boy. And his dad, when he arrived, I think it was at the hospital or somewhere, hoping that it would be a girl. He basically just, when he discovered it was a boy, he just shoved the flowers at his wife, just, and walked out, because he wanted a girl. And some of you, there's very subtle rejection that you experience, because in your minds you feel like, you know what, I know that my parents would have wanted a boy. And it comes through. Now today, your parents are happy with you and everything, but as a child, you interpret it in a certain way. And often that influences you to reject a certain part of your gender identity. It doesn't mean that you necessarily uh, go certain extremes of that. But you'll find that if you were a girl and you grew up and you knew that, you know what, dad would have wanted a boy. What typically happens in those families is that dad then raises you like you're a boy. I know of a particular um, person where his mom, he, he's just got older brothers and his mom really wanted a girl and his mom literally raised him like a girl. Taught him how to cook, taught him how to do all sorts of things. How many of you know that that's a mother wound? And this, this person was close to his mom. Thought the world of his mom. Mom did all sorts of wonderful things. But how many of you that his mom robbed him of his gender identity, the fullness of his gender identity, because of her preference in that situation? Amen? Constant criticism of the child. Constant criticism of the child. When we talk about bullying, bullying doesn't just happen at schools. Bullying also takes place in families. Amen? How many of you know that a parent can bully a child? How many of you know that there are different types of bullies? You have what's called the screaming mimi. You know the screaming mimi? When you talk about workplace bullying, you have a lot of, a lot of screaming mimis, but you also have them at home. It's the person who has to bark and scream loud just to get certain things done. And they create an environment where people around them feel intimidated. And some of you who grew up in such an environment, we see it playing out at church. Where someone might give you a gentle nudge and say, you should have done this like this and this, and you can't handle it. I've seen it in churches. And these people freak out and they're like, oh, what have I done something wrong? It's like, no, we're just correcting you. It's the voice of that critical mother. So you have the screaming Mimi, but you know that when it comes to bullying, you also have what's called the constant critic. And the constant critic is the kind of person who will say, no, I think you should use a blue pen, not a black one. Then you, you take your pen and it's now black. No, you should actually use a purple one. Purple, black, blue, what do you want me to do? Where you feel like you can never do anything right. And some of you grew up in those environments and it's affected you today. These are the kind of people who try to control your self-image. So when everyone is praising you, saying, wow, great job, well done, they come and they whisper and they say, don't get too excited. They'll change their tune. They'll change their story next week. They're trying to control your mood on a day-to-day -day basis. And look, we love our parents, don't get me wrong, but these are the type of environment, types of environments that people grew up in and it affected them, amen? Comparisons with other children or siblings. You must work harder like your brother. Some of you have shared your testimonies and you grew up in environments like that. And so what happens to people like that is now they're in the workplace and you'll see they're always looking over the wall, comparing themselves, comparing themselves. Because deep, si deep inside you, there's that strong sense of, 
I don't think I was ever my parents' favorite. They always liked so-and-so. And didn't matter how well you performed, you might have been the better one academically, the better one sports-wise. You would strive after all those things, but you saw that in their hearts, they seemed to click better with one of the other siblings. I want you to know this morning that wherever you've been wounded, God steps in and he brings healing and restoration to you. There's no gap that God your father cannot fill. He says, and even if your nursing mother forgets about you, I will not. That's the nature of the love of God over you. Lack of affection. Competing with the child for your husband's attention happens. Sometimes you find that a mother has lost her husband and now she's looking at her children and actually competing for attention, male attention from her son-in-laws. You see this happening. And that's where you have moms flirting with your significant other. That's a common thing. You understand that? That happens, right? It's not just in the movies. And that's a source of rejection. Lack of blessing at puberty. How many of you know that when a girl is that age of puberty, when a guy is that age of adolescence, they need the affirmation from mom and dad, not just dad. Often we emphasize the role of father. How many of you know that your mother plays a crucial role, men? Your mother plays a crucial role in how you see yourself as a man, not just your father. How many of you know mothers in this place, when you tell your sons that, wow, you look handsome in that outfit, that helps to boost their self-esteem in terms of how they look. Amen? It's a very sensitive time in children's lives. Abandonment. Abdication of your role as mother. Your children need you to play the role of mother. But some people, they're more a friend than a mother. You see what happens with a lot of moms, if you haven't dealt with your own wounds of rejection, what tends to happen is you so desperately want to be accepted by your children and you find yourselves just being buddy-buddy with your kids only and no longer being mother. Using the child to sustain the marriage. You see this happening with a lot of women today where they engage in a performance mentality. Like, if I'm just a good mother, my husband will accept me. If the children are always clean and fed and well looked after, my husband will love me more. And so the driving force behind your behavior is actually acceptance from your husband and not just mothering the children from a place of love. Poor health of the mother what do you do when you're not feeling well what did your mother do when she was not feeling well you see your children can end up feeling emotionally responsible for you it's one thing when a mother is not feeling well and she says you know what no it's fine guys I'll be okay it's another thing when she says but I was feeling sick and what did you do so when are you coming back and there's deep manipulation and domination because of an illness. And you see many older people remaining sick because they find that their illness gives them attention and acceptance from their children. We've seen that in families, haven't we? Poor financial con conditions. Some of you grew up in families where the financial conditions were poor. So you always felt like you were a burden to your parents. And they would make you feel like you were a burden to them. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Okay. And so you now today, you find it difficult to receive from people. I'm trying to show you the link between what you experienced, the wounding, and today. Why would we find it difficult receiving from people? How many of you struggle to receive a gift from someone? Let's be honest now. Confession time. You generally find, how many of you find it difficult asking for help? Okay, so many people in this room, we find it difficult. What is it in us 
that causes us to want to be independent because the mark of maturity is not independence it's interdependence where I can say I need you for A, B, C, D but I can also help you with X, Y, Z and there's no shame in that but what happens is that if you were raised in an environment where being weak is seen as a shameful thing needing something is seen as you are a burden you will find it very difficult asking for help. Could it be that the very people that God is sending into your life right now to help you, where God is your source, but he's using that person as a vehicle of blessing to you, could it be that maybe you're not seeing it? Could it be that you're insisting that, Lord, can you provide for me? But I want you to provide in the following way. And you're now stipulating to God how he must provide. My son Samuel... He's very passionate about triathlons. Wonder where that comes from. He's very passionate about triathlons. You, know, you all know triathlons are, right? Now I've spoken to some people, like sometimes I'll say, yeah, I'm just, I need to fill up. I'm taking my wife to a triathlon. And the guy says, what's that? All right. So you run, you swim, and you cycle, right? So those three things. So he's, Samuel has become very passionate about it. And that's all he's talking about. He was even singing it on our way to church okay i won't tell you exactly what you're singing right but what is interesting about this is that when you are passionate about a particular thing when you're ignited about a particular thing in you you're excited about it you want to do it you're dreaming it you're thinking it you uh you, when you're trusting God for the things that go with it like he's been believing God for a road bike a racing bicycle a road bike you can end up thinking it will only come one way. When I have my birthday and my parents will bless me with it. So he had prayed for a road bike. And what happened was that someone then blessed family members of ours with a road bike. And it was fixed up and now he's been blessed with a road bike. And I was trying to show him the link between the prayer he prayed and him getting a road bike. And what was interesting was he said, I, I prayed about it. But I didn't know it would come this quick. And I remember saying to my wife, I'm so glad he had this experience so that it shifts him from thinking the only way God will provide for me is through my parents. Amen? Some of you, God is taking you into a space in your lives where you receive from people. For some of you, during the course of this week as homework, it'll be good for you to go and ask for help where it's been a, a thing of shame. Amen? Amen? Sometimes there's an ungodly bond between mother and son where the son cannot make any decisions for himself. He is very controlled and manipulated by his mother. And when he grows up, he continues experiencing this control where his mother always comes first and everyone else comes second, even his wife. One of the ways in which children experience rejection and wounding from their parents is when the mother lies how many of you know that a lot of mothers lie and they justify lying if it means my lying is going to protect my children but where does it stop it's one thing if a criminal comes and says are your children here we want to shoot them it's one thing to protect them because life there's a higher law and you're saying you know what they're not here it's just me that's one thing but it's another thing where you don't tell them about certain things going on in the family Amen? Where you lie about certain relatives who are actually dangerous people who they should actually avoid. And many of you, if you think back, you've been wounded by that. I know some people who will say, I only discovered when I was about 30 years of age that my father had another family. That my father had another family. It was a big family secret. And you can see there's this deep wound that yes, my father was ashamed of it, but why didn't my mother tell us? Oh, I wanted to protect you. Oh, I didn't want you to dishonor your father. Father had done it. Amen? Amen. These things always come out anyway. And there's a wounding. And you find people who grew up in environments like that, today they don't trust authority figures. They believe there's always a catch. And they're not plugged in a church anymore. Why? 
Because I don't trust authority figures. Pastors will lie to you. They'll be nice to you for now. But at some point you'll discover something that they didn't tell you. Why? It's what we call transference. That wound that you experienced growing up, you've now transferred it onto these wonderful people God is placing in your heart and placing in your life. And now you're like, where's the catch? Where's the catch? Someone is going to drop me. How many of you are feeling me on this one? And you do what we call rejecting yourself before you can be rejected. Because it's safer, isn't it? Let me reject myself before I can be rejected. I don't trust any of these people. There's a guy called John Townsend, and he's written a book called Hiding from Love. Hiding from Love, where the very people God has placed into your life to mentor you, to counsel you, to help you go to your next level, you distance yourself from them. We say to you, hey, don't you want to learn from that individual over there? Hey, Paul, you know what? I've got my boys. Those people are in another league. But when we go deep into the wound, we see that it's a wound of betrayal. Where you are betrayed by your parents. You're betrayed often by a mother. We've spoken about the father wound. For those of you who've just come this Sunday, we're not just picking on mothers. We dealt with the father wound. So we're now talking about the mother wound. Amen. Lying to protect her children. In the book of Psalms, 101 verse 7, it says, He who works deceit shall not dwell in my house. He who tells lies shall not continue in my presence. What family secrets are there that you've been forced to keep all these years? And if you just communicate it to the outside world, it brings shame to the family. That's dysfunction. Amen. Now, as children get into their teens and into adulthood, there are dynamics that can occur that deepen this particular wound. And so here's a checklist for you. Does your mother demean or criticize you, make you a scapegoat, take credit when things go well and blame you when things go wrong, treat you as if you're incapable of making your own decisions? Remember, all of this applies to you if you're a child, but it also applies to you if you're a mother. Are you doing this right now? Turn on the child for people but turn cold when she's alone with you try to upstage you flirt with your significant other try to live out her life through you we need to be very careful of that right does she call email text and schedule herself into your life so much that you feel smothered does she tell you or imply that you are the reason for her depression Mom, why are you looking so sad? How can I be happy when you've done this? <laughs> Does she imply that you're the reason for her depression, her lack of success, or unfulfilled life? It's because I had to sacrifice for you children. Now you see, I couldn't even study myself because of you. Does she tell you or imply that she can't cope without you and only your help will do? Does she use money or the promise of money to manipulate you? Might have happened when you were growing up. Does she threaten to make your life difficult if you don't do what she wants? I've seen this happening. I know of a particular grandmother. Let me just say it like it is. I remember when we were growing up at a certain point, my, my grandmother, I remember we were challenging them about ancestral worship and things like that. And she was like, I know some of you, you, you think that these things won't happen. You think you can act however you want, but you'll see what will happen to you when I die. You'll see what I'll do. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right. I remember her saying that. Okay. And I'm sure it happens in lots of families in a very subtle way. As people get older, they'll use that as manipulation. But how many of you know, and I'm, I've been saying this to a number of people, a curse without a cause cannot alight. A curse without a cause cannot alight. So, so I speak to people and they're like, oh, I think people are tampering with me. I think people are doing some things to affect me and so on. Can only do it if you give them the power to. Amen? We must know our authority in Christ Jesus, that we are in Christ Jesus. Every tongue that rises against me shall fall in the name of Jesus. 
The Bible tells me that I'm hidden with Christ in God. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Does she ignore or discount your feelings and wants? I know grown men today, when they're around their moms, they become like a little child and your wife doesn't recognize you. How many of you are feeling me on this one? We're watching a movie and, they, and, and the guy was complaining. I don't know, some of you might have watched the movie before. And the, and the guy was complaining. He was saying to the girl, he was saying, when you're around your dad, you become like a little 12-year-old or something, a little girl. The Bible says we'll leave, you leave your mother and father, cleave to your wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Amen? Amen. So men, as grown adults, still be a man respecting your parents. Amen? Amen? Women, as a grown woman, still relate to your parents. And if they want you to do dodgy things, go and do rituals and things like that, you say to them, you know what, we don't believe in that, mom. We don't believe in that, dad. We're not doing it. Don't be bound by the fact that you didn't bond with them when you were growing up and now you're just looking for their acceptance. I see people. I see people who don't change their schedules, who change their schedules when parents come and they're around for the weekend. I was talking to Pastor Michael about it. We we're talking about it. If someone comes from outside and they're staying with you over a weekend, they should know how your fam family operates, that this family goes to church on Sundays. I think it's too many Christians where it's like, I oh, know my mom was around so we couldn't. They must adjust to your lifestyle. Michael was telling me that, you know what, in their household, if people are staying with them, they know that in this family we go to church. We won't force you to come to our church, but Sunday mornings you won't stay. You'll go somewhere. You'll find some church somewhere. <laughs> That's just how we operate. Okay? With us, people know. If people come and visit us and so on, we'll be like, hey guys, you know what? We'll just carry on with our routine because it's an important routine, but cool, we'll hang out when we can. Oh, my family was around, so we didn't come. Where were you last week? Oh, no, my cousin brother was around, so we didn't come. To Where were you this week? Oh, no, my cousin sister was around, yeah, so we were away. Then the whole month, and you're not fellowshipping. So your value system is not shaping things. Amen. We could have said, oh, this morning, Jaden has got a cr cricket festival. We're all going to watch him, so we're not coming to church. Amen. Amen. There will always be something competing for this. Now, there are five categories of mother wounds that I've just covered. Category one is the severely narcissistic mother. This is the mother where it's all about them. And this is such a serious thing. And if it applies to you as fathers, please, if, if the shoe fits, please wear it. Do you ever have it when you're trying to interact with someone? And it's all about them. Every question they ask you, they'll only ask the question if it's going to affect them. It's never about drawing you out about something to do with you. There's the narcissist, narcissistic mother. There's the overly enmeshed mother. Enmeshment is where you don't know where you end and where the next person begins. So your child fails their math test and you feel guilty as a mother. How many of you know that maybe your child will never ever be as good at maths as you? So your child not getting 100% or 90% in maths is not always a reflection of whether you're a good mother or not. Especially if you're performance orientated in your mindset. It's important that we allow our children to go the way they should go, not necessarily the way we went when it comes to gift and talent. And by the way, the next series we're going to be doing, starting in a couple of weeks, in a few weeks, is going to be on gifts and callings. Understanding how gifts and callings work. Number three, the control freak mother. Who has to be in control of everything. Control of the wedding. Those of you who are planning to get married soon, it's your wedding. Not like what some people say. Our marriage, their wedding. No. 
it's your wedding. For me, what's important, what is important for me at my wedding was that it was my wife's day. It's usually the bride who remembers that day and has got specific things they want to do. Other people use weddings for family feuds. So you now have this aunt arguing with that aunt and it's a power struggle between the two of them. Now you want it to be a joyous occasion for everyone, but just be careful of the control freak mother. If your mother comes and visits you, she shouldn't be instructing your helpers at home. Saying, do it like this, paint it like this, do it like this. You have to have boundaries. And if you struggle giving those boundaries, it means that there's something unhealthy in your relationship with your mother. Are you hearing me this morning? What we do is we honor our parents by saying, what do you think I should do concerning this child? I value your wisdom. But she can't give you the, it as an instruction like you're still a little baby at your house growing up. Are you following me? And those of you who feel awkward with this kind of message, I feel for you and I should pray for you. Because that awkwardness that you're feeling means that you're bound very often. It's a witchcraft spirit of control, domination, and manipulation. So you feel guilty setting boundaries with parents. You see, God has called us to seek the wisdom of our parents. But when our parents come into our homes, they don't call the shots. They respect the fact that you've left mother and father and you're now heading up your household. Your self-esteem doesn't just go down because mom is, in, mom is at home. And she's now saying, okay, the kitchen is going to be like this. No, you mustn't have this like this. Oh, 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 oh. You know what, this that I'm talking about now is one of the biggest causes of divorce today here on the continent. It's where parents get involved uninvited. Number four, mothers who need mothering. It's another type of mother where they themselves need mothering. Number five, mothers who neglect Betray and batter. To batter is to physically abuse, right? Mothers who neglect, betray, and batter. So what's the impact of all of this? The impact of a mother's rejection of the son. One of two roots. The son can reject the mother's blessing as a result of it. So he ends up expecting rejection from women. He ends up isolating himself from women. He desires to assert independence from women. He ends up in conflict with female authority figures. And please note, it's not just when your mother does this to you. Sometimes you might have had a domineering aunt. There was one guy who had issues with strong women. And he realized that the root issue was an aunt of his who he just dreaded. Because she was like that. He transferred it onto any strong woman in his life. You can end up being hard and harsh in relationships. You can end up sexually unresponsive and rarely romantic with your wife. You may, be, you may unwittingly push your wife into the role of mother. And your wife ends up feeling rejected and mistreated. And this is all because of that mother wound. I'm wanting us to go really deep into these things because that's where the freedom is and we're going to pray. But then there's also the son who's experienced rejection from the mother and as a result, he doesn't reject the mother's breath, blessing, but he strives for it. And this is another type of man. And this person is predisposed to love and acceptance from a woman. So often becomes a womanizer. Needs to be in close, intimate relationships with women. Can't relate to other men. Doesn't feel confident amongst other men, but really is looking for connection with women. And it's what we call hyper-masculinity. You know when a guy is trying to prove his masculinity by his exploits with girls? But we can see right through it and see that this guy doesn't actually know he's a real man. So he's looking for intimacy with women to prove to himself that he's a real man. Amen? His identity is in how he is viewed by women. So as he dresses up each day, what will the ladies think? How will the ladies view me? He needs that. He's got a strong focus on physical appearance. He may smother his wife. He may be possessive and jealous. His wife feels her love is never enough for him. 
His wife feels smothered, drained, and inadequate because he's looking for something in her that he should have received from his mother. Is everyone following? That he should have received from his mother. What's the impact of the mother's rejection of her daughter? Mother's rejection of her daughter. Well, same thing. She could reject the mother's blessing. What's the blessing of a mother on a daughter? Well, she could end up predisposed to not receive love from women. So ladies who've been affected by this mother wound, you literally end up finding it sometimes easier connecting with guys, working with guys, doing various things with guys. And then you have female mentors who want to pour into you, but there's just this block. And what ends up happening is you end up not getting mentorship for motherhood, mentorship for being a wonderful wife, mentorship for just being a woman in the workplace. But God is sending these women into your life. Mistrust of other women. So you get married and you're always like, mm, mm, mm. finding safety and solace in men. Expect to be rejected and not approved by women. Works better with men than women. Through bitter root judgments may reproduce in herself the hated qualities of her mother. The very things you didn't like in your mother, you see them outworking in you now because you didn't forgive your mother. You remain connected to that thing you hate in your mother because you didn't release her, the forgiveness thing we've been learning about. May be detached from her feminine identity so you can become this extreme tomboy where we can look at you and we can see this is a beautiful woman but you haven't embraced your femininity. may demand love from her husband but not allow him to. And there are many women like that today where it's like, I want you to do this for me, I want you to do this for me. But the moment the husband tries to show them love, sometimes they even sabotage that. There must be a catch and they reject that. But what happens when she's striving after the mother's blessing? When she's striving after it. So the first one was she's rejecting it. When she's striving after it. Well then, she strives after acceptance from women. She becomes highly self-critical in the same way that mother's mother said, you're not really that good. You're not really that great at A, B, C, D. She internalizes it and she becomes self-critical. She may despise her own femininity. She may place more energy into friendships than her marriage because she's looking for that female connection. She may enter into lesbian fantasies. Her husband may feel ignored, not needed, and dishonored. So finally, what are the steps to healing? What are the steps to healing? The first thing I want to highlight, we must know that we were planned by God. I want to minister this to you prophetically this morning. Know that you were planned by God. It doesn't matter how you were conceived. Know that you were planned by God. In the book of Psalms 139, I'm going to read verse 13, verse 15 to 16 also I'm going to read. For you did form my inward parts. You did knit me together in my mother's womb. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being formed in secret, intricately and curiously wrought, as if embroidered with various colors. Isn't that beautiful? In the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed substance. And in your book, all the days of my life were written before ever they took shape. When as yet... There, were none, there was none of them. Isn't that powerful? God designed you. God shaped you. You might think, like, I wish I had a different shape. God shaped you. Amen? You're beautiful. You're the complexion of your skin. Embrace it. Head size. Everything. Embrace it. Number two, know that God can fill the gaps. Whatever gaps, cracks, and leakages are in you, know that God can fill the gaps. Up, Psalm 71, verse 6, Upon you have I leaned and relied from birth. 
You are he who took me from my mother's womb and you have been my benefactor from that day. My praise is continually for you. From that day. These are the things God has called us saints to meditate on. These are the truths we must know as we go into this life. Number three, forgive those that have wounded you. Why did I share everything I'm sharing? I want us to be conscious of the wounding. Because if I'd come to you and just said, like, were you ever wounded by your parents? You'd just say, ah, they were okay. But then why are we how we are today? Forgive those that have wounded you. There's no bad mother and good child. You know, sometimes we get into this mindset of, my mother is all bad and I'm all good. No. They're things we've also done. Father, forgive them for they didn't know what they were doing. Very often we were parented by our parents in the way that they were parented. And they had their own wounds that they passed on to the next generation. Just like you are possibly passing on some of your wounds right now to the next generation unless you deal with them. Amen? What are some of the things to forgive? Say, Father, I forgive my parents for not giving me the attention I needed. I forgive my parents for not speaking words of, of blessing and love to me. I forgive and release my parents for abandoning me. I forgive and release my parents for not protecting me. I forgive and release my parents for judging me harshly. I forgive and release my parents for making me feel I wasn't good enough. With all good intentions, but the result was you felt like you weren't good enough. I forgive and release my parents for making me doubt my self-worth. I forgive and release my parents for not loving me, for not providing meaningful touch, for making me feel stupid. How many of you know that there's some parents where if you're clumsy with something or you drop something, there's a look they can give you. And some of you are doing it to your children right now, where there's a sense of shame if they spill something. As if you can't spill something. For not nurturing me, I release you. For being too busy to care for me, I release you. For love based on performance, I release you. For playing favorites with siblings, I release you. For making me keep family secrets. Things where you needed counseling for but you couldn't mention to a soul. I see it happening, guys. When I deal with people, it's so interesting. Someone will say something that isn't even a big deal or a big issue. Oh, my father was a bit like this. And then the moment they finish saying that they're praising their parents about all sorts of other things, it's as if they can't just make that statement that my father failed in the following way without qualifying it. We all know most parents are great. They tried. But we have to be able to name these things saints for smothering and controlling me and what's powerful is if you write out a prayer to ask God to release this pain and anger that's in you so many people are angry today and that's why if you just push a nerve you just pick, pinch a nerve they explode like where is this coming from unresolved issues Number four, take responsibility for your own behavior. You can't say I'm a womanizer because my parents rejected me. So I'm just a womanizer. You can't say that. You're responsible for your own behavior. There are many other people who grew up in the same environment as you, but they didn't turn that way. Amen? Take responsibility for your own behavior. Because I've got anger issues because my father had anger issues. Forgive him. Release him. Renounce it. Break that flesh pattern. It's possible in Christ Jesus. And then number five. Remember the good things that they did and thank the Lord for them. Remember the good things that they did and thank the Lord for them. You see, it's so easy to focus so much on the wounds that we're just conscious only of the wounds. Sometimes you might need to say this to your parents or thank God. 
You spoke words of love and blessing to me. You recognized and valued my gifting. Father, I thank you for when they held me. Father, I thank you for when they made me feel good about myself. Father, I thank you for how they told me they were proud of me. Father, I thank you for how they were always there for me. I thank you for when they came to my activities. I thank you for how they nurtured me. I thank you for how they showed genuine interest in me. I thank you for how they protected me. I thank you for how they didn't play favorites. I thank you, God, for how they encouraged open communication. I thank you for how they encouraged my independence. I thank you for the love that they gave me that was unconditional. There's so many things that we can thank God for in our parents. Amen? And there's a healing that happens as we do so. I want to encourage you in your healing process. Write a prayer of thankfulness for the ways your mother and father cared for you well.